You're welcome back. Right now, we've said that uh, the president, uh, Ahmed Bola Tinubu, has been advised to go after barons responsible for bunkering. Uh, that's our second hot topic that we are going to briefly take, up, or take on now. And we're glad to be joined by a political affairs analyst, uh, Dr. Omoshola Deji. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, oil bunkering. Uh, we've been seeing news every day how our oil is being bunkered and we don't know how to go about it. Salis now is telling the president to go after barons responsible for bunkering. What are your thoughts? Well, the president asked um, to go after oil bunkers, looking at it from the perspective that Nigeria operates a monoproduct economy dependent on oil. What that means is that a large chunk of our resources, um, of our income, is being earned from oil and gas um, mining and production. In that case, if oil bunkering is allowed to persist, definitely it's going to affect the income of the country. And that has been on for decades. But government has not been able to adequately respond to it because the perpetrators some of them are in government some of them are in top hierarchies in the military in the police in the navy but then the responsibility now for some government to see how it, the the issue can be tackled holistically in such a way that the nation will not be at a loss while the few continues to profit from oil bunkering. Hmm. But how possible is this? Because, okay, government go after these people, and you've just mentioned that part of them, or some of them are top government officials, or top military officials, or top people in the society that may not even be in government, but they hold the strings to uh, how government is run in a country. So what steps do you think the government can take, can take to make sure, or the president, not just government, the president can take to make sure that these people are held accountable? Well, first, government must realize that TMS is an essential commodity. And if PMS is expensive, definitely the poor has to find a way around it to survive. So first, making PMS as affordable as possible. I've argued that I, I, I likely don't buy the argument that because PMS is, um, because there is poor subsidies come, then the subsidy should be outrightly removed. All across the world, government subsidized in one way or form or the other. But if Nigerian government says it is no longer going to subsidize PMS, then how do you expect the poor? Like, okay, imagine the rural community, not Lagos. Now, let's look at the interland. Look at the economic value of some of these communities. Then you ask the poor Okada rider to come and buy well, of about 600 naira per liter or more. So making it affordable by going after the poor subsidy thieves and make sure that that is neat in the board. When you go outside the poor subsidy thieves, then things would level up. But you don't leave the thieves to, have and to be enjoying the loot that they've done. Then you now pass the pain to the ordinary Nigeria. I use myself as an example. I can't think of anything that Nigeria has done for me since I was born. I can't think of anything. I stand to be corrected. So one of the rare ways I'm benefiting from government is buying petroleum cheaply. But now that benefit has been removed from me. So going after the big guys, that's one. Two, technology. In Saudi Arabia, for example, there is high technology in such a way that when there is oil bunkering or you try to tamper with the oil pipeline or any form of um, malpractice at all, 
definitely it's going to signal them at the nearest office. There's um, a helicopter to tackle this thing. The, 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 the amount of fuel that is flown from one station to another is being recorded. You can't even steal anything. That is the essence of technology. So you ask yourself, what is stopping the government from embracing this technology and what is stopping the oil multinationals as well from embracing this technology? So if government can't embrace the technology, why not compel the oil multinational to, to make sure that adequate technology is being embraced in such a way that it makes bunkering difficult? Now, another thing is standard of operations. If you compare the standard of operation in Nigeria and West African countries where mining is taking place, compare it to the European countries, the American countries, you will see that the standard of operation is different. By that I mean, if Shell is exploring oil in Nigeria, the standard of operation that they will be using will be cheaper, will be less expensive than the standard of operation that they will be using in the Americas. So we have a weak government that have failed to stand up to its responsibility of enforcing adequate standard of operation in such a way that what you do in Mexico, the Americas, is what you also do in Nigeria. Another thing that government can do is ensuring the decommissioning of oil facilities. I use the case of Ogoni, Ogoni land as an example. Shell stopped oil exploration in Ogoni land in 1993. Since Shell stopped oil exploration in Ogoni, the oil facilities there, they are still there. Shell did not disassemble, or if you like, you know, as it called in professional parlance, decommission these facilities. Failure to decommission these facilities, these facilities get old, some of them spill oils because the company is no longer there. Some of them are accessible to oil bunkers. How do I know this? During my PhD, my research was on the oil issue in the Niger Delta, and I spent months there during my data collection. So I saw it firsthand what shelf failure to decommission its oil facilities in Ogoni is causing to the people. So when you fail to decommission your facilities and these facilities are readily accessible to the people you've um bedeviled their land with environmental degradation then what do you expect them to do they have to survive they are ancestrally agrarian people they rely on fishing and farming their lands have been polluted the um water sources has been polluted the next thing for them is for them to survive based on the oil that they can see around them so the failure to decommission Facilities is a, a, is, a, is a major issue that government must tackle. Another thing that government can tackle is the easy accessibility to oil pipelines. Oil pipeline is supposed to be beneath the Earth's surface. But if you go to the Niger Delta in Nigeria, you would see that most of the oil pipelines are unreasonably easily accessible. You see pipeline passing through a community. Oil pipeline with, you know, um, strong pressure, that oil is pumping strongly every day. You will see it pass through the backyard of some people. In other words, government has allowed the oil multinationals to operate with impunity. If they had put the oil pipelines beneath the ex surface, all the oil pipelines, definitely it will not be easily accessible for the bunkers to access it. But if you put oil pipeline on, you know, um, on the edge surface, in the backyard of a man that you have polluted his farm, that he can no longer fish because the rivers and water bodies in his community has been polluted, definitely such people are going to improvise which is for them to now find a way of how to survive via the oil that is in their community. And that is why you see that some of the citizens there engage in oil bunkering. Oil bunkering is in two ways. The oil bunkering being conducted by the big guys. 
in the sense that those that steal oil and put it into ships to sell to the um, Americas, you know, Togo, Cameroon, you know, all those places, those guys operate on a large scale. Those ones, their vessels, some of them are even being secured by Nigerian security agencies. Then you have the medium stroke small scale, which are the artisanal refiners, whereby they steal the oil and they, 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 they do what they call coal fire. That's the local parlance there. Coal fire, which is means the oil will be cooked under, you know, um, wood heat. So when it's cooked, then it begins to filter. And there is a ready market available for it because the local population in the Niger Delta can't afford afford the foreign refined oil being sold for about 600 naira per liter at the moment. So maybe the one that was refined through coal fire, maybe those ones will sell for, like, uh, um, government has not removed um, crop subsidy while I did my data collection, there, but I guess maybe now it will sell for, like, maybe 250 or 300. So that is quite affordable. So those medium and small scale are the ones that, you know, are owned by, you know, um, some of the community leaders, you know, cultists and um, some political talks that when um, politics is not um, top at the moment, they fall back to that assisting a refinery. So those big guys that bring vessels and ship to the Niger Delta and both the small and medium scale has to be tackled holistically. In other words, stop the big guys, then make um, environmental remediation as quick as possible or you legalize artisanal refinery and create agencies that would um, monitor their operations and pay taxes to the government. So in other words, the artisanal refinery will be accountable to the government and they will also pay taxes. But still, you can use only force to stop the oil bunking in the Niger Delta. It will never work if anything is to go back. Okay. By constant experience, it won't. Okay, uh, well, this is how we're going to wrap up the show this morning. But uh, you've said a lot uh, about how uh, we can remedy the situation. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deji, for coming on the show. Thank you. Always my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, that was a, a, a political scientist and public affairs analyst, uh, Dr. Omoshola uh, Deji talking to us on the show. This is how we draw the curtain on the program this morning. We'd like to thank you for your time this morning and hope that you'll join us again uh, for the same program, same time uh, tomorrow. Until then, my name is Nyamgul Agaji on behalf of the entire uh, Breakfast family saying thanks for being there.